And good evening, everybody. It is the last workshop of January. Just checking. Um, we have a couple of topics tonight, a few small bits of business. Um, so we have some folks on the call we haven't had in a while or before. So by way of introduction, um, Deputy Mayor Tweeps Phillips Woods. I'm Kathleen Foley. I'm the mayor, Trustee Catherine Fatty, and Trustee Bozy, Laura Bozy. And Trustee Starbuck is not with us tonight. So um, opportunity first to request to vote to add or modify agenda items. Any requests? OK. Um, announcements. One semi-brief announcement. So uh, I participated in a conference call with um, uh, Mayor Wood, I'm sorry, Mayor Winward of Nelsonville um, and Supervisor Van Tassel and um, Council Member Jason Angel regarding the reports issued um, by the Public Service Commission on Con Ed. Con Ed. I still say Con Ed, Central Hudson, pardon me, Central <laughs> Hudson. <laughs> Um, Public Service Commission has, did an extensive report. We met with PULP, the Public Utility Law Program, um, to sort of help us understand and take apart the PSC findings. Um, it turns out that a lot of the rate hikes were related to an upgrade of a computer system that Central Hudson knew was not ready for airtime, um, an $88 million um, and computer up upgrade. Um, and there is activity around advocating to not press that onto the taxpayers. Taxpayers have already, they've recovered $24 million of it to date from, from rate payers. Um, so we're at a point of understanding what to do next. Um, but it's, the report's pretty damning if you haven't had a chance to read it. Um, it's on the PSC website. Senator Scoop has also did a report. Um, and so uh, we have been invited by the town to meet in joint session to observe uh, a public comment session that they will have at town hall, inviting Pulp to make a presentation and then inviting the public to make comment on their experience. So we have a, a documented record of local um, local issues in Phillips Town. So it's looking as if it will be the 22nd, our Wednesday session on the 22nd that will convene at Town Hall. The clerks are working together to make sure that we properly notice under open meetings law and, and do everything, check all the boxes that we need to check for process, but we will be posting that and meeting at Town Hall. 222. Two, the number? February. Oh, February 222, yes. 236, Maine. <laughs> okay. 238, Maine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have with us Doug Hahn, who's our consulting engineer from Hahn Engineering. Um, I wanted him to join us to talk us through um, the review that, that Hahn did regarding the bid packet, the, the responses to the bid packet for the emergency interconnection to the Catskill Aqueduct, and hope that the board will approve me tonight to sign um, an agreement related to it. Doug, if you would please. Good evening, Mayor and uh, members of the board, everybody out there. Um, so did you want me to walk you through the plans, what it is, the costs, contractor? What uh, is there anything in specifically? Very, you want very broad, just... very broad picture. How did we go from recognizing that we needed an emergency connection to going out to bid and what the project, what the project is that these folks are bidding on? Very, very big overview. Okay. Well, uh, as probably everybody knows, there was uh, the reservoir was low this summer. Uh, it was almost considered an emergency. Um, so what we did was we worked with the DEP. Um, they have extensive files, so that was kind of nice. They have um, previous plans and projects and everything in the area. So um, we worked with them to gather information. Then we determined, uh, well, they, they had actually kind of been planning, as was the village, where the connection would be um, on the Catskill Aqueduct. Um, so this, this will um, essentially supplement the village's reservoir system. 
Um, so when backup, it was, it's yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an emergency backup. Um, the uh, connection was made initially in about 1996, but it hasn't been used as I as I understand for over 10 years. And so the uh, the existing connection connection was not functioning, and we needed to make a new one. So the DEP uh, themselves went out. They made a connection to the aqueduct, and the village is responsible for connecting from their existing transmission main. That will bring water from the Catskill Aqueduct to the uh, front of the village's water treatment plant. Um, the connection requires 150 feet of six inch pipe plus a backflow preventer and meter. And um, we went out to bid, uh, I, think, uh, I think it was in November, uh, end of November, uh, we put it out to bid. Bids came in, there were five bidders. Uh, prices had a wide range. Uh, the lowest bid was contact construction for $373,000. Uh, after them, there was two bids, uh, just over 500, 547 ish, 547,000. And then the other two were, were much higher. Um, we have, we've actually worked with all the contractors that bid the job. Um, contact has, has done multiple projects for us in the past. Um, they, they've always done good quality work and we, we don't have too many issues with them. So we were, um, I would say we were pleased to, to get contact construction. Um, is there anything, I mean, that's kind of. That's it in a nutshell. Are there any questions yeah. from board members before we proceed to resolution accepting the bid? Okay, would you like to read it into the record? Or would you like to make the motion? Sure, I will make a motion. Um, to accept the bid for emergency interconnection to the Catskill Aqueduct. Second. Second. Okay. Oh, yeah. Read the resolution. Yeah. I don't know if you want me reading today, but we'll try. Okay. Resolution 03-2023, accepting the bid for emergency interconnection to the Catskill Aqueduct. The following resolution was offered by uh, myself, mm -hmm. Teresa Rose Woods, for adoption, seconded by Catherine, whereas on November 22nd, 2022, the village issued a request for proposals, an RP, for the installation of approximately 175 foot of ductile iron pipe located along Fishkill Road and related work as needed for establishing an emergency connection to the Catskill Aqueduct. And whereas the five bids were, were received with contact construction submitting lowest bid, and whereas James J. Hahn, Engineering PC, reviewed all five bids and made a recommendation to the Board of Trustees to accept the bid of contact construction. Therefore, it is hereby resolved that the village awards the bid for establishing an emergency connection to the Catskill Aqueduct at the cost of $373,365 to contact construction, and it is hereby Further resolved that the Board of Trustees of the Village of Cold Spring authorizes the mayor to sign a contract with contact construction pending the submission of the required security bond and insurance by the contractor. This is a roll call vote. Trustee Bozzi? Aye. Trustee Fatty? Aye. Trustee Starbuck is absent. Trustee Woods? Aye. And Mayor Foley? Fully aye. Officially adopted on this date by a vote of 4 0 with one absent. Thank you so much, Doug. And we'll thank you. And uh, anything else? Is that it? Okay, great. Thank you. Have a nice, uh, nice night, everybody. Okay. Similarly, um, Trustee Bozzi and I have made contact with Tectonic, the engineering firm that, um, beginning around two seven, 2017, was engaged in looking at the structure of our upper and lower reservoir assessing structural needs, um, looking at access. They are the, 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 wealth, the wealth of knowledge um, and working with them build, builds back into the process um, a, a depth and clarity that has been lacking. Um, and so I'm, I'm pleased to request that we get back on board with Tectonic. They're already, they've already provided 
huge amounts of information that are in, immensely helpful. And I feel like we will be um, in the process of parent getting access and repairing the dams that we're, we're ahead of the game working with them. So um, you've all seen the um, proposal that Tectonic put forward. Um, this is an initial proposal that um, includes a schedule of estimated fees for several particulars, safety inspection of the dams, in-person consultant, consulting meeting, virtual consulting meetings, um, making a public presentation to the village board, helping to lay out easements, um, working on our behalf and with us with the DEC, um, consultation is needed, um, and then reimbursable expenses. It's a, it's a contract proposal for 25,300. Um, and it seems to me an investment well worth making. So um, any discussion or questions? Any comment on? No, I'm uh, really glad, uh, looking forward to having this move forward. Um, and just, the, you know, the first section is the inspection and then the others are kind of as needed meetings and, and guidance. Um, and so those are more variable. Yes, expenses. And I, I think that's appropriate um, to have that in place at the beginning. So would someone like to make a motion authorizing me to sign the agreement with Tectonic? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, great. So we've got two, that's two big moves forward mm -hmm. on dams. Uh, is it at this point to ask how did you visit the our site visit? Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. We we so Laura and Matt and I went up two weeks ago now. Um the time is the time is flying. Um, it was very enlightening. Um, there are there are a couple of there are a couple of access options. Um, we have some some research research to do on easements that were established in 2010 under Mayor Gallagher, um, and also need to have a look back at um, when the village acquired the dam. What what um, what came with in terms of restrictions and access, because I'm not sure that that's been as fleshed out as it should be. Um, the dam was happily, the spillway on the lower reservoir was overflowing that day, so we were at capacity, mm -hmm. and I'm sure we are continuing to be at capacity mm -hmm. with the rain today. Um, but now it, it feels it feels within reach. There's one, there's one, there are a couple of obvious short routes and, an, and, a, and a very long route. Um, and I think that as we Talk about this going forward. We really, we really need to talk about this as how we establish permanent access, so we're not in this position again. You know, mm -hmm. efforts in the past have looked at emergency access. Um, I think we need to fully establish constant <laughs> an access for public water. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay. Well, now we're on for our primary item of the night. We have with us um, Ted Fink, who is a planner. Consulting with the village. Ted has been um, part of my life with the village for a very long time, going all the way back to 2009 and the comprehensive planning process. So he too brings a lot of institutional memory. Folks will recall, and Ted's gonna Ted's gonna go into more detail, but very briefly, last November, um, a, a series of code updates were adopted. The updates to the zoning code were not adopted. Um, there were several outstanding issues. Um, so the project was abandoned and left to this board. Um, and in the spring, we appointed um, a group of folks to look at the outstanding issues, make recommendations, um, and help us get to public hearing. We got approval from NYSERDA to extend. We got a, one last approval, and NYSERDA wants to see this done too, um, to extend, um, to have everything completed um, in June, which puts us into March for public hearings. So I've asked Ted to join us tonight to sort of bring the public up to speed on where we left off, what remained, and how the ad hoc work, ad hoc working group on the zoning update has been proceeding. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Ted. Anything you'd like to open with? Well, uh, sure. I. I... I um, want to get the slides up on the screen, obviously, um, but it's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I'm kind of surprised that I'm still here after so many years, beginning in 2009. This was supposed to be a, a pretty quick process of helping the village develop a local waterfront revitalization program. Um, and it's turned into so much more 
than that. And so um, what I'd like to do is um, not spend a whole lot of time on history, but just give you a little bit of background um, for anybody that's not really famil that familiar with zoning and how it all fits into um, a municipality like the village. Um, what the state law has to say um, is the relationship, for instance, between a comprehensive plan and zoning um, and how what we're doing right now is an attempt to try and take the official village policies and translate them into new rules uh, for the village. So I have, um, I think it's 17 slides to go through. I'm hoping to get through this in you know, 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, so I'm gonna be pretty brief. Um, and certainly I'll be happy to answer any questions um, after I run through the slides. Um, if you see anything, if you have any questions as I go along, you know, don't hesitate, just raise your hand and I'll be happy to answer the questions uh, for you. And um, so I believe that you have set it up for screen sharing. Yeah. Uh, looks like not. Okay, so I'll be able to share the screen, my screen. Uh, which has the slides on it, if you are able, if Jeff is able to uh, okay. open up the screen share. Yeah, yeah, there. And then you can make him a co-host and then he can share. Yeah. Okay, now you should be good. Oh, okay. Yep. Looks like that went through. All right. <clears throat> okay. Can everybody see this okay? Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right, good. So I'm just going to get through it. You're going to see there's little uh, thumbnails of each of the slides here. Sometimes it works to try and actually do the slide show as it's intended, but sometimes it's not. So I'm just going to go through each of the individual slides, give you a little bit of that background, um, beginning with New York State Village Law, because everything we do here that's related to uh, planning and zoning has to be enabled by the New York State Village Law. And one thing that I think is important at the outset is to understand that the state legislature in giving the ability of local municipalities, cities, towns, and villages in New York State, um, the authority and the responsibility to undertake comprehensive planning, they consider it one of the most important um, powers and duties uh, that the legislature can give to a local municipality. And really it's to, for the purpose of protecting the public health, safety, and general welfare of all citizens. And so one of the, one of the concepts which um, I always find that people get in reverse is that everybody thinks that the zoning regulation is the, the most important aspect of land use control, but in reality, it's the comprehensive plan. Uh, the comprehensive plan is the end. It's a, it's a statement of um, all of the various ways that the village operates. Um, and it's, it's the end in itself. And uh, zoning regulations are just one means of uh, implementing the comprehensive plan. Uh, and so once a comprehensive plan has been developed, um, the village had one going back to 1987. Um, and that was um, the most current one. And in fact, um, back in 1987, uh, and this is part of the genesis of how this all came about, um, the village had also prepared a local waterfront revitalization program at that time. But New York State Department of State, um, which is the coastal management agency for uh, New York State, they did not approve the village's proposed local waterfront revitalization plan. Uh, and so 20 years later, uh, the village wanted to go forward and give it another shot and see if uh, preparation of a local waterfront plan was, uh, was possible. And so that's how it all started in 2009. Um, but essentially, <clears throat> Zoning itself, it's the, um, it's the way that land use is, is generally regulated in New York State. It's a very simple document, although it's complex, which is one of the reasons why um, it wasn't finished up in November of 2021. Uh, but at its most basic form, zoning defines uses uh, that property uh, may be devoted to, um, how new development is sited on the land, and uh, what sort of density 
uh, would be an, um, uh, permissible under the zoning. All right, so that's that's basically what what zoning is. So as far as the local waterfront revitalization, um, the village did get a um, uh, a grant from New York State back in 2009 to develop uh, what we had thought at that time was going to be a local waterfront revitalization program. It turned out to be what they call a revitalization strategy. Um, and there was a special board that was appointed. It was made up of Cold Spring citizens, and uh, they worked to develop that local waterfront revitalization strategy. It took about two years to pull together um, that um, strategy document. And um, that document, the LWRS as, it, as it's known, was approved by the New York Department of State. And so that um, is really the, the first step in the process of the village getting um, a local waterfront revitalization program in place. What the village did at that time though, um, because the local waterfront strategy uh, really served uh, more than one purpose, um, the village had um, also looked at that document as being a new comprehensive plan. And so right after the local waterfront strategy was adopted, um, the village board also adopted a comprehensive plan. It was a separate document, uh, but it does uh, share a lot of commonality with the LWRS. Um, and so that pretty much led the way to um, have the village update its zoning law because that was one of the major recommendations of both the local waterfront revitalization strategy as well as the comprehensive plan. And one of the reasons why the Department of State was not yet ready to um, approve a local waterfront revitalization program, which is the full program that implements the state policies on a local level. Um, there, was a, there was a good reason for it. Um, there were a lot of recommendations in there for making changes to the zoning, because generally um, we found that um, the zoning followed a suburban car-oriented model. Um, it was initially enacted in 1967, and back at that time, um, there were a lot of planning firms that were around that were helping communities throughout the Hudson Valley uh, to develop essentially suburban uh, type zoning that would allow for, um, for bedroom communities to be developed um, all throughout the Hudson Valley. People would simply um, you know, commute by car to New York City. And of course, that was a, a flawed concept that um, we now have, have really paid a price for in a lot of communities. Um, in any case, <clears throat> um, one thing that is important to keep in mind is that the local waterfront revitalization strategies are consistent with the village comprehensive plan strategies. So you, you have two good documents in place um, that have guided um, development and will continue to guide this process as we move forward. So some of the important things that are in the village's comprehensive plan um, were really four uh, goal and policy statements that have to do specifically with, um, with the work that we're, we're um, preparing at this time. One is um, the overall goal for the village, which is to preserve and enhance the small town historic, neighborly, diverse, and safe character of village life. So that was the overall goal um, for the comprehensive plan. Um, and so with that said, um, the um, comprehensive plan recommended that land use regulations uh, be reviewed and modified as necessary to ensure clarity and internal consistency. Um, to explore some of the newer um, state-of-the-art planning techniques like the use of form-based zoning for new development and redevelopment, um, and to make sure that when the zoning is amended to require appropriate scale, setbacks, streetscape, and design features that are consistent with the village character. And this is an important one because the way that the zoning had been developed in 1967, um, and this leads me to the next slide, uh, about what is clear, the historic village could not be rebuilt as it is today under your existing zoning, okay? And that's a really important consideration. You have a beautiful historic village and yet you could not even uh, rebuild it today. And that's part of the problem um, that the um, 
the village is now facing and which the, um, uh, the uh, committee that was appointed is now having to deal with. So on its way to getting to today, um, there in the interim, um, what happened after the local waterfront strategy was adopted, comprehensive plan was adopted. Um, I think the village at that time um, was searching, okay, well, now that we've got this local waterfront strategy, we've got this recommendation to change our zoning, how are we gonna find the money to do it? So there was another grant um, from the state that was awarded to the village. Um, I believe it was in 2013, 2014, somewhere around there. Um, to actually implement the 2012 plan recommendations. So um, based on that, um, the village board appointed a code update committee. Uh, they worked from uh, 20, I believe 2014 until uh, November, 2021 um, to develop a whole series of amendments. Uh, and these were amendments that didn't just deal with the village zoning, but there were many other code provisions that were also in need of updates. And so these were handled by the code update committee. Um, yeah, most of these... interrupt for, for one moment, just for a point of clarity, the, yeah. CUC, the CUC handed off its recommendations to the village board, I believe in 2019, 2018. And the C, and the code update committee um, then no longer met. It was left in the, in, in the hands of the standing, the board that was standing at the time. So the CUC okay, so, did work and made recommendations, and then the trustees proceeded to work on those from those recommendations. Okay, okay, that's a good clarification because I wasn't actually involved at that time. Um, right. I was only brought back in, in in I believe in August of 2021 um, to help at that time with uh, with things like the zoning and so forth. Um, but the conclusion um, in 2021 was zoning still needed additional time. Uh, and so that was left to, to you, uh, lucky you. All right, so um, in the spring of last year, um, there was a ad hoc working group um, on the zoning update that was created. Um, there are seven uh, people that are, that are participating in this. I'm participating solely as the consulting planner, uh, but everybody else on the ad hoc working group are uh, actively engaged in village affairs um, are, or are village officials. Um, and so it's a very good working group and we've been meeting um, every week to two weeks um, for quite some time now. Um, basically the overall goals um, that we're um, we're working on is to review and develop recommendations on state-of-the-art planning techniques um, to try and come up with um, ways to be able to correct the mismatch between um, the many non-conforming lots. And these are lots that were, um, were developed in the village before there was even zoning. And the standards that currently exist that dictate um, the um, various bulk requirements that every um, person that wants to do anything on their lot in the village has to abide by. Um, so one of the things, if, if you go back and, and you look at uh, some of the things that were the, uh, the goals for, for this was um, to create a more uh, user-friendly graphic standards that address things like context and scale and magnitude of, of new development, how um, houses get sited on lots, how buildings um, relate to the street and so forth. Um, and so those are being worked on as well. Um, and the other thing which um, we're dealing with is a recognition that regardless of, of what is done with the existing zoning uh, and any sort of new updated rules that are uh, enacted, that there may be um, historic buildings within the community that, that may not meet these rules. And so we're developing ways uh, to be able to, um, uh, to deal with that. So people are not required to go to the zoning board um, to get variances every time they wanna put a, a new porch on, on their back of their house or, or whatever. But the, the overall um, thought about uh, zoning uh, and why to bring it up into the 21st century um, from the mid 1960s um, 
it's a, it's a great quote by this fellow by the name of Ed McMahon. He's a planner like myself. Um, he's written a number of books. He's a, he's a great speaker. He goes around the country, talks with people about, um, about planning. And I'll, I'll give you just a moment to, to read through his little quote here. But I think the important thing that he has to say in this, this long-winded quote is about, if you want to be a successful community, pay attention to where development is put how it's arranged and what it looks like, because that's one of the secrets of successful communities. Okay, so right now uh, the working group um, is working on three principal tasks. One is to introduce new user-friendly graphic standards to illustrate uh, the community's vision. So uh, the character of the diverse neighborhoods that you have in Cold Spring can be preserved and enhanced and that uh, aligns very well with the comprehensive plan policy and I've indicated here the exact policies that are in the plan uh, that apply. The second one is to um, address potential for redevelopment of the marathon site. Um, and just so you know, it's currently zoned industrial if you didn't already know that. Um, and the idea here is to have it well integrated into the fabric of the community. The third one is to protect Mayor's Park for recreational purposes. Uh, and those are all um, policies um, that are taken right from um, the village comprehensive plan. And what I have in here um, is a little graphic that shows you the, the, the big difference between um, the kind of thing that we're seeking to integrate into the zoning, which is um, to take advantage of traditional neighborhoods and to design the zoning around the neighborhoods that Cold Spring has. Um, whereas the kind of zoning that you have in place now, it's really conventional suburban zoning. It's characterized by a uh, uses being separated from each other, where you have residential neighborhoods and cul-de-sacs, all loading onto um, you know, single arterials that, uh, that take traffic, large amounts of traffic to shopping centers and supermarkets and schools uh, and everything else, uh, jobs and so forth. And the idea with um, uh, the kind of things that we're trying to integrate now is to, um, to view the village as a well-developed community um, and, to, and to keep it that way. <clears throat> so one of the things which we're doing is we're looking at form-based code uh, standards in a hybrid approach. And form-based code was uh, recommended in the comprehensive plan and the local waterfront strategy um, as being one of those things that has the potential for, um, uh, for good use within the village. And so what does a form-based code do? Well, zoning controls how much you can do by integrating form-based standards, you also address um, how you can do it. And I'll, I'll show you in a moment what that means. Um, so <clears throat> basically with form-based elements in the code, the rules are expanded to describe how to keep the changes within um, the scale, the context and the design traditions of the village. And that is through uh, a series of, of illustrations that would be added to the zoning. And their goal really is to um, enhance what's already in, in place rather than allowing the situation that you currently have to deal with, which is you have to create exceptions for, uh, for anything that, that anyone wants to do with their property if it doesn't meet the exact um, numeric dimensions that are within the, the zoning. <clears throat> Hold out of character and, with the village, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And other communities, um, your neighbors to the North Beacon, Poughkeepsie, uh, the town of Warwick and the village of Warwick over in Orange County, uh, Red Hook up here in Northern Dutchess, uh, the town of Rhinebeck has done it. Um, and there's been other Hudson Valley communities that have also adopted um, hybrid form-based code standards because they're concerned also with how their communities, um, and the character of their communities can be protected. Um, so, this little graphic at the bottom here, um, this is how the current zoning 
defines a one block parcel of land. Basically, you have things like density, use, setbacks, parking, maximum building height. They're all specified in text and the zoning consists of text alone. Um, many communities will take that uh, standard zoning and what they'll do is they'll develop design guidelines because they don't like the way that um, the zoning makes new development look. And so they, I, they identify what it is that they want to, um, they want to have within their community. They do design guidelines and this helps a little bit, you know, it pretties up that big box that you have here on a one block parcel. All right. But the way a form based code, um, works with zoning, it defines individual lot characteristics that every lot has to, um, uh, have to, has to conform with. And I'll get in, in a moment into exactly how that works. So basically, um, just to take this a little bit further, um, the, the, um, the ad hoc group is working with uh, fixing that mix, mismatch between the older non-conforming residential lots and the zoning laws, dimensional standards. And the idea here is to remove obstacles for homeowners that wanna make improvements to their houses, but at the same time, ensuring that when new development does happen, um, because one of the things which um, has been a trend in many communities are what they call pop-ups and scrape-offs. Pop-ups are where an existing building um, that may have a lot of historic character um, that new additions are put on that building that takes it out of scale with the neighborhood. Um, the scrape-offs are where a building and, you know, this may not apply in the historic district, but outside of that, there's still a lot of important historic buildings in the village that are not within the National Register and, uh, District and the village's historic district uh, that if they were to be demolished, uh, they could be replaced um, with a building that would meet the strict letter of the, the current zoning, but may not be a good fit with the historic character of Cold Spring. And so... <clears throat> The little graphic that you see down here, um, it's just one of many graphic standards that are uh, that are used within a hybrid form based code uh, that show exactly how buildings um, are scaled on lots within the village. OK, um, and as we I said before, you know, the part of the process, too, is to recognize that historic buildings may not meet all of the existing or updated rules. So um, an important component to having um, this for hybrid form-based code is to include provisions that will encourage and facilitate the preservation of the important historic buildings you have um, while avoiding new suburban style development. <clears throat> so um, the second task um, that we're working on is to develop a process and standards for a mixed use district um, because the village all of this area that is shown as yellow is zoned industrial within the village. And I'll get into in a moment uh, the kinds of activities that could be developed on places like the Marathon site, which is this parcel right here. Uh, and so a lot of concern was expressed back in the time of the local waterfront strategy preparation of the comprehensive plan about the potential for the Marathon site, because essentially it's a clean slate. Well, I, I shouldn't say a clean slate. It's it's a it's a, a a field at the present time. It's not a green field. It's it's a brown field because of the former uh, uh, Marathon Battery contamination of the property. Um, but the idea here is that eventually it it may be judged to be completely clean, and uh, so it could be developed as a, um, as a lot, and, and I believe it's the largest uh, remaining unprotected, undeveloped lot within the village. And so the idea here is to ensure that it's well integrated into the fabric of the community, as, as I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and here's the marathon site um, from um, Google Earth. And there were very specific policies that were um, uh, that were developed for the comprehensive plan. Uh, number one, make appropriate access to and from the marathon and environs, and that's um, you know the foundry and, and so forth. 
um, a prerequisite for any development there, ensuring that development does not create traffic problems that will unreasonably adversely affect current residents. Uh, <clears throat> consider the site as a mixed use uh, for residential, recreational, open space, work live, small retail and office uses and require special use permits for any development on this site. Um, the third one is to ensure the environmental integrity and safety of the site by making certain that a thorough study and remediation of contaminants uh, is performed before any development begins. Um, and finally, uh, for commercial development on the marathon site, encourage businesses that would be tax positive and have a low impact on the community in terms of traffic, noise, et cetera. But just to give you a, a sense of um, what is currently permitted on marathon, all right, this right now, this is the list taken from the existing zoning. Um, it defines the permitted uses for the industrial zoning district. There are no special permit uses for the industrial zoning district. These are all what are called as of right uses that are permissible today on the marathon site. And I'd like to draw your attention to um, some of these things. The first one, of course, is that um, any use that's permitted in the R1 uh, one family residence district. But when you look at some of the other uses, manufacturing, assembling, um, will not create dangerous or other um, hazards, but basic industrial um, building could go up there. Lumber, building materials, equipment sales and storage and so forth. Um, those are the kinds of things that are permissible today on the marathon site. So <clears throat> what happens when you have a 15 acre site like that um, within a very small self-contained village um, and it's important to ensure that any sort of a mixed use development that would happen on Marathon um, is, is given the proper safeguards. And so um, one of the things which we are, are looking at is to consider a two-step process. Um, and that would be for the village board to have a broader authority to um, approve a special use permit for a mixed use plan development of the site. Um, and that would be the first step that would be taken. Uh, that would be subject, of course, to an environmental impact review. Um, and assuming that um, the development plans that were prepared for Marathon um, met the approval of the board, the next step then would be to go to the planning board for site plan approval um, and um, to ensure that the the village can continue to be the place that residents want it to be. And so we're looking at a, a fairly robust process of review and approval um, in that two-step process uh, where the village is going to investigate uh, some of these sorts of things uh, to make sure that access is adequate, make sure that the, the site is properly remediated uh, to make sure that the mix of uses is, um, is something that's going to work for the village. So we're looking at requiring things like fiscal impact analyses and that sort of thing. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that uh, the ad hoc working group is, is working on now. <clears throat> the third task, the final one, is to ensure there are proper protections for Mayor's Park. Um, and this is the, um, the parcel right here along the waterfront, uh, Mayor's Park, of course, and then the highway garage in this area. Um, and just like Marathon, this area is currently zoned I-1. And so the policies that were um, developed for the local waterfront strategy and the village plan, very simple, preserve Mayor's Park, rezone Mayor's Park to recreation. All right, so they're um, fairly clear um, what those policies are. Uh, so that's really the third task. Um, we haven't really um, spent a lot of time on that yet. It's fairly clear what the direction is from the comprehensive plan is to make sure that this is um, properly protected for the future. <clears throat> and so finally, um, this is the schedule that we're under. Um, 
going back to um, spring of 2022. Um, this is the one that was the final extension to the work plan that was developed for the granting agency, which is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. They were the ones that granted Cold Spring the, um, uh, the funds to enable the village to be able to um, develop these code um, amendments. And there, there is a lot of work to be done here. Um, but at this point, we're knee deep in the preparing and editing um, the draft documents now. We're, you know, we're getting close to having uh, a plan for having these all ready um, for public review um, in the next couple of months. So I think that's that's pretty much it from uh, from my standpoint. Um, so Thank we'll you, stop Kevin. the share. So we'll start first with any questions or comments from trustees. Um, I I have a comment. Um, having been a little bit of part of the process before this iteration of the board. Um, I appreciate the work that you've done and the clarity that you've brought to it. Um, I think for most people, including myself, um, and, and I have a little bit of a background in some zoning stuff, um, it, there was like a mystery and a sort of a need to know basis about this process. And I think that your simple deck is really just like made things much clearer. And I appreciate that that's the, that's the goal in mind to make this a process that we can actually follow and do good work. So thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. The last time we worked together. Yes. Well, thank you. Just my um, real appreciation. Paul Henderson and Eric Worth are um, leading on the updates to the residential district and bringing just like a real kind of data driven mm -hmm. research based approach of looking at assessing every every lot in the village and seeing you know where it falls with the current zoning and if we change this number you know what percent would come into compliance and, and bringing just a real expertise to it that I think also makes the decisions that will come before the board more understandable and defensible so um, I think they're doing really good work they really are yeah and we have with yeah. us tonight Jesse Jesse St. Charles is with us as well. He is a zoning board member and we have just brought him on um, for assistance with, I mean, we have a lot of work to do in the next few weeks um, for assistance on getting us to deadlines with um, the NEU, the mixed use district. Um, so looking forward to Jesse. Jesse also brings a, a, a data mind, um, not just sort of, he does bring a data mind too. So looking forward to that. We appreciate it, Jesse. Um, any comment? We have one member of the public in the room. We have, I think, only Jesse and Mike on the call at this stage. Are there any other questions or comments from audience? None? Okay. Well, thank you for bringing us up to speed. We'll speak with you tomorrow at 11, I think. Okay, yeah. I um, so. And we'll keep rolling on. So we'll be posting, uh, the clerk will be posting out dates for public hearings um, and, and proper notices. So the public has plenty of time to review drafts um, on the village website um, and to prepare to come in and, and make comments. And will the slides yeah, be, yeah, the the slides slides be posted? And make available on the website. You've got them. And if you have any questions, you know, don't hesitate to, to contact me. You know where to find you. Thanks so much. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Okay. So we have a few more items of board business. Um, first, to announce the resignation of Steve Etta from the Recreation Commission. Um, Steve submitted his resignation last week. Um, Steve is one of the builders of um, recreation in the village as we know it. He was instrumental in the development of Mayor's Park from um, you know, basically a dump um, into a proper park. Um, and we we have what we have because of the work of Steve and other volunteers like him. We are absolutely grateful for his service. Um, have a good night, um, and wish him wish him plancha and cheers. Um, and whatever comes next for Steve, I will say that we've had 
um, a number of folks express interest um, in joining the Recreation Commission. Um, we'll be we are asking the the remaining members of the Rec Commission to have a chat, make recommendations, put them before the board members as well. I think we can get back up to um, full full speed pretty quickly. Um, which brings me to the next item. Um, after reflecting on our workshop conversation last week about ticketed events and the number of things that we need to consider, oh, make a motion to accept. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll, go ahead. Uh, make a motion with appreciation to accept the resignation of Stephen Etta from the Recreation Commission. With appreciation, seconded. All <laughs> in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Claire. Thank you. And carrying on from there um, with the discussion we had last week on events, ticketed events, um, and having a sense of all of the moving pieces and things that need to be considered both from a practice standpoint and, and from code revisions that need to be made to the, to the rec, excuse me, rec commission chapter. Um, I would like to propose that we put a moratorium on um, accepting applications for ticketed events um, at this time uh, until we can get some of those other pieces in order so that we're properly prepared to review applications and the rec commission is properly prepared for its role. Um, discussion? I I completely agree. I think we have we still have work to do to figure out how how we use our our facilities and our um, and sort of balancing the community's needs and outside um, vendors' issue, interest in in our uh, using our community spaces and making sure that we're valuing it the way it should be. So um, I support putting a moratorium on. And so good event for the moment. That is the second part of the discussion. <laughs> Do you have a sense of a timeline for putting those pieces in place? I would imagine, I mean, we probably should select um, a period of time. I would think that June, June, if we if we align it with budget cycle, mm -hmm. um, end of May, May third, May 31st. And if we need to revise, we can revise. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Ticketed events. So ticketed events. So, yeah, so, so the, the birthday parties, parties and yeah. community yeah. uses. Community uses. Events. Yep. What we're yep. talking about is yep. festivals, yep. et cetera. Okay. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, it is time once again to approve our annual service and maintenance agreement with managed technologies. The guys who keep made this possible, connected. keep us connected, um, support us on a, a, a regular basis with technical issues and who also brought us all onto teams, including trustees and staff. So there is um, a 40, I think it's a $40, roughly $40, 40 per dollar. hour increase. Um, but this the company $40 has per hour. Per hour. Forty dollars per month. Per month. Excuse oh, me. Per month. Did I say hour? Sorry. Yeah. Per month. Yeah, we're going to increase on their hourly rate, but that only happens for special projects. It's they've held their rate flat for almost five years, um, and I think it's a reasonable adjust adjustment given that time period and also the demands that we've put on them in terms of technology. Um, and they serve us well. Discussion? Okay, um, may I have a motion? And, and let's be clear that this is for the, the village hall, the water treatment plant and the highway department. The police have a separate contract with um, um, managed technologies related to security, et cetera. Oh, motion to approve the renewal of the annual service and maintenance agreement with managed technologies. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, approval of minutes from 1130. Um, my edits were incorporated. Um, any discussion of those minutes? Further discussion? 
Okay, I have a motion. Mm -hmm. I make the motion to approve the minutes of uh, November 30th, 2022. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Um, and before we go into public comment, just a, a quick update. A couple of weeks back, we looked at legislative priorities, and now we're seeing with the presentation on 134 tonight, our discussion of Recreation Commission, how we're moving forward on those. Um, we had talked with the, the village engineer about doing um, a roadway survey and prioritizing um, which projects get addressed first. Um, that the, the format of the surveys that Han regularly does are more related to sort of paving priorities. And it's very clear that we have some big infrastructure issues that need to be addressed sooner rather than later. So we have, I've, with, and Laura was part of this conversation as well as we were talking with engineers, um, recommending that they focus their energy on three big, <laughs> moving forward three big and long outstanding projects as the focus of their work first, and then come back um, to paving. Um, not that pave, paving will not be done, but they're gonna focus their engineering <laughs> prowess on um, three locations and bringing proposals forward to the trustees. And those are, um, the, the culvert on Fair Street, the storm drain that runs from roughly where um, uh, Spring Bra Springbrook ends um, across the street and along Mayor's Park to the underwater parcel that the county owns as one, um, to the culvert that is on private property by easement between White, I'm sorry, Grandview and Fair, so that area that's always washing out during storms onto Fair Street, that that uh, failed drain, which the, the village we did we did identify um, an easement from 1968. Um, property owners giving the village access um, to install infrastructure there. It's clearly our infrastructure. Um, and the last fair up, uh, look having a having a, a hard look at the intersection of Mountain and Fishgill, where none of the grades work, none of the <laughs> none of the catch basins work. Um, there's just any number of issues coming together in one place there. So Han's gonna look at look at those, make recommendations to us, um, and then we'll work through the budgeting process with Michelle to figure out what we can hit and address in the next if any can be started this season before this budget closes with the money we have left and then what shifts into the budget season after that. We can't use chips money for that. We may be able to use chips at Fishgill and um, uh, mm -hmm. Mountain. Yes, sorry, I'm having a really hard time thinking of street names tonight. Um, and that, that's one of the reviews they're looking at is how do we optimize the federal dollars and state dollars that we have for paving, et cetera. Also, there are grants from um, the DOT related to culverts, um, which I think previously we had understood to mean big objects. Um, culvert through the engineers can simply mean a storm drain. So there may be ways for us to optimize monies on fair streets that they refer to it as the fair street culvert, meaning the drain that goes along fair street to the underwater parcel. He makes based on a culvert of the pipe. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. I, 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 I was I imagining it was under a bridge. Yeah, yes, you know, right. Like under, but this is the, this pipe is also under a road. He thought that it was. Yeah, culvert. We had ruled out when those announcements, when those grant announcements came out at the end of last year, we had ruled them out, M Michelle and, and we had ruled them out thinking that because what we, what we identified as a culvert, on Fair Street, meaning uh, uh, the, the big pipe on the slope, because it didn't carry um, traffic, didn't qualify. But Fair Street does carry public traffic, mm -hmm. so th there may be some opportunities for us to optimize on that. Oh. It's we they we it's all it's all a big unknown right now. The point is we have to drill down and and okay. make a plan. The other thing that Doug said that made sense for both of us was that um, for when you have undersized, you know, we have this like flooding problem that we have too much water for the for our system and he said you start at the bottom and you make the improvements and then you work your way up so 
starting at Fair Street is appropriate. Yeah, you start there and then we go back up the system. So this is a this is a multi-year a multi-year issue that will be with us while we're in office. It will probably continue beyond any time that we're in office where there's a, a lot, all almost nearly all of the village's stormwater comes down to that location yeah. at Fair Street um, because of the way Backbrook has over time been redirected and underground and sunlit and et cetera, et cetera. It's all coming between, ultimately coming between church and garden, landing on Northern, going through Springbrook and out to Fair. Um, and it's just too much. It was it was one thing 60 years ago. It's another thing now with the storms we're dealing with and the condition of the pipes that are there. Is there a design element to capture? Well, that's one of the things that we've asked Han to look at is, you know, what are are there ways for us to be not just discharging into the river, but how are we using the water that we that we do have? That's actually really I haven't thought about that. I mean, I live back brook is in my backyard mm -hmm. and um it there's not if the idea of doing kind of um green infrastructure of of putting in something in place that there's more that is absorbed as it goes through is actually yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah rather really than discharging all at the end is it's, it's a neat even idea or catching in other places yeah we just yeah, yeah. More so because, because, yeah. well it's that's very yeah. much yeah. part of their um it wasn't so much part of this conversation but yeah. conversations we've had previously about addressing Stormwater is what what can we do smarter? Yeah, we should look Great. at California yeah. because they're going well, to be on the cutting edge of that. Well, yes, and, and actually, you know, the that that issue in California is I think important for all of us mm -hmm. to keep in mind. Um, this was part of our discussions with Tectonic. Um, there had been a proposal um, commissioned by the land trust to look at um, the development of wells um, for drinking mm -hmm. water and abandoning. The upper dam, but it's clear from California's experience, and certainly from um, both Han and Tectonic, saying when you when you have surface source groundwater, you protect it. You don't get rid of it. Um, and here we see California trying to put small dams in place wherever they can to capture to capture stormwater. We have we have surface source water that we need to protect. Um, so you know that's not ruling out the possibility for well at some point, but that would be secondary to preserving the the, the surface source water we have. Okay, so that was a lot of update. But any public we have we have Jesse and Michael re remaining. Any public comment or question? Not even from the current. Okay, you <laughs> answered all the questions. <laughs> I can't even think of one. <laughs> so in that case, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Jesse. Good night. Good night. <laughs> After recording.